Over to you, Julian. Thanks, Helen, and welcome everyone. I'd like to um, just introduce the five people on our panel tonight. So, um, if you don't mind waving, as, as I say your name, so that you, you're visible to the other people, um, and perhaps saying something so it actually pops up because uh, you get spotlighted. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce farmer and land manager, author of best-selling book, Call of the Reed Warbler, Dr. Charles Massey has an Order of Australia Medal and is one of the leading faces of regenerative agriculture. Thanks very much, Julian. Welcome, and, everyone. Yeah, great. Thank you. And Laura Dalrymple and Grant Hilliard, who run Feather and Bone Providors, a butchery that only buys whole animals and are totally committed to full transparency in meat production. They're also educators about the ethics of eating meat. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, social justice guy, Marat Keskin, is head honcho of Ubi Sydney, an enterprise that exists to rebuild local food economies. Hey, guys. And urban farm creator, Steve Batley, who has been helping people in Sydney grow their own food. Steve thinks aphids are cool and is obsessed with regenerative agriculture certainly in part due to Dr. Charles Massey. <coughs> now, what I'd like to do just to kick off is uh, perhaps, I guess there's a quote and then I'll ask each of you perhaps to give just a little, your, your sort of initial first thoughts about the movie. But thinking about the movie and, and this quote around from Don Campbell, which is, you know, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. And if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. I feel as though the movie goes a, goes a really good way to really changing the way we see things, especially for us in the city. So, Charlie, would you mind kicking off, being probably the furthest out from the city of all of us? Nice, easy question. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Um, I think the way I interpret changing the way you see things means really a paradigm change rather than just um, trying something a bit different. Um, because this is really all about perception. And um, I really love the movie, even though I know there's a lot of money gone into it. What it did was really illustrate um, our role of regenerative farmers or gardeners or whatever is to empower nature to self-organize itself back to health, which she's had millions of years to develop and which we've repressed with industrial agriculture. And, that's really what they were doing, uh, layer by layer. They were empowering that self-organisation capacity. And um, yeah, okay, a bit unreal, a bit fairy tale, but um, they captured the heartbreaks and, and the, uh, you know, the pest control elements and the idiosyncrasies of the animals when you farm. And I, I just loved it. I thought it was uh, and beautifully shot and, uh, and very empowering. Murat, your, your impressions. Um, in terms of seeing things, I think I would go even deeper than that and like um, challenging our own thoughts and then and, 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 um, sometimes our own logic which sort of like um, is, um, yeah, we, 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 I feel like we tend to stop where we think logic has found place, so um, it's really just based, logic is based on our own set strict of principles. And um, I, I, I loved the movie. I think it depicted something really, something important, really beautifully. Uh, it depicted that we are able to uh, create change if we do trust nature and that we can transform um, something, you know, seeing that land into something uh, that has life again. Um, in terms of uh, I do think it is important to look into the money that has gone into that movie. Um, I do think it is important to look at uh, the viability of farms. Um, and I do think regenerative farming over time certainly um, is um, commercially attractive. Um, however, there, however, there's also a long time of um, that, that long time where you don't make any income could be quite, um, it, it, these are sort of certain things we, I believe, also need to look into. And Steve? 
Uh, for me, the perspective shift and the, and the way, changing the way you look at things, um, certainly uh, I think it's how, how you see yourself and your role in the, in the, in the ecosystem. So I think that, um, you know, the, the industrial model is I'm, I'm in charge, I'm, I'm responsible for managing and, and well, not managing, but for doing the things in the system. So if there's a pest, I go out there with my spray and I kill it. The ecosystem model, you're, you step back and your role is, is to observe and to understand what's going on and let the system manage itself. So I think that's the big shift. It's the, I'm not the doer, I'm, I'm the manager and the, the creator and the manager rather than the, the technician, I guess. It's, it's, I think um, for me, a really powerful shift. Maura? Mm. I think, um, I mean, all of the above, absolutely. Um, I don't know, you know, for me, uh, the thing that I found so wonderful about the film was that it focused on, uh, as we've said, a story of transformation and a story of hope. And in our, in our shop and in the conversations we've been having, especially since we uh, published our book, um, you know, we hear so many people saying how overwhelmed they feel with the hopelessness of the situation and the complexity of the food landscape and the difficulty of making ethical choices. They just feel, you know, they feel so plagued by that and so besieged by that. And it's all so opaque and difficult to make sense of that they end up making these really binary choices. I eat meat, I don't eat meat, I do this or I don't do that, you know. And what's lovely about the film is it shows a positive example of how people can choose to engage more productively with this question and this problem and take control of this situation and actually take control of their lives. And, you know, it's a message of optimism. It's a message of hope. And it's those stories, I think, that we all need to be telling more and more and more to help people to work out how to chart their course through all of this, because it's incredibly confusing and opaque and difficult and worrying, you know, for a lot of people. Um, so I think that's, for me anyway, that was the really lovely thing about the film. It was, it was um, hopeful and optimistic and energising. I'd agree with that, but I'd also say that the focus on, the focus on complex, complex systems mm. Yes. and the desire to mm. complexify systems mm. to actually produce simplicity from mm. that, 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 that is a complete paradigm shift because mm. virtually all the food production systems that we encounter are highly simplified systems. Yes. And it's really sold to us that only by simplifying the system can you produce enough food to feed people. Mm. There's no sense that there's a cost associated with that simplification. Mm. And what really you know, came out in the, over the eight years of the film was how once they put things in place, which was a very active, active role, and they could only stand back after they put those things in place. So, so sort of relating to what Steve was saying, it's 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 that you you have to be an active participant initially, but once the building blocks for uh, action take you know are in position, then you start to see the development and and the increasing complexity of the, of, of the systems that they've, they've all, it's an orchestration effectively. Which and is I, what Charlie was saying too, you step, nature's capacity to self-organize, you know. But when you looked at that farm when they arrived, yeah. <laughs> it, it wouldn't self-organize if they had just moved in. That's it. They yes. put in really, yeah. and with yeah. the help of their mentor, they put in really sort of key developmental things, obviously, and, and worked with the systems there, introduced water and, and cover plants and all those sorts of things. And so all of a sudden, you know, it starts to spring to life in, in ways that they, <laughs> they obviously don't enjoy uh, initially and, and they get sort of surprises from. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's the sort of the knowledge acquisition. In a way, they're mascots for people in the city because yeah. they arrived as, as sort of fairly naive city dwellers. And I think it's, it's a really good sort of way of, of understanding how you function in a complex system. But that thing, you know... Yeah, <laughs> no. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Now, I guess perhaps one of the questions that us in the city might be wondering, and so this is to you, Charlie, to begin, is how, what does regenerative agriculture look like in Australia? What does it look like for you on your farm? 
and I guess then we'll, we'll take it out to the rest of you. How could this be applied to us here in Australia, both as you know, consumers and, and, and you know, supporters of farmers? At the moment, Australia is one of the leaders in regenerative agriculture worldwide. Um, we've got a lot of the, uh, a few key individuals who've evolved new cropping systems, new systems of agroforestry, and uh, trialled um, sort of ecological grazing. So um, a lot of our landscapes, the practices are, are in large landscapes. Um, so we are seen as, as a, as a nation of innovators uh, in this area. Um, my personal experience, uh, we shifted probably um, 25 years ago. And so we went cold turkey on the industrial inputs. And so there's a bit of a decline in production um, initially, um, but that's compensated by the fact you're saving on huge costs on fertilizers and, and chemicals. We did a little bit of uh, we decided spraying for only about two years, but um, uh, in, in the uh, regenerative cropping space, um, and, and, and there's some wonderful examples in Australia, uh, the, the depression in production, um, once the system's up and running, their, their productivity is not far behind, if not equal to the industrial system, but they're eliminating about 90% of costs in fertilizers and chemicals. And so that's quite significant. And that, then the uh, major benefits then are in nutrient-rich food for human health. And in places like Western Australia, once you have nutrient integrity grain grown the proper way, uh, you're not susceptible to um, things like um, frost damage or rain at harvest, which can be devastating and is the cause of much of the major uh, uh, debt in, in the Western Australian wheat belt. So, I mean, that's skating over broad territory, but there's, there's some really exciting things happening. I would say, even though I'm in a very conservative district, uh, nationally, if you think about the innovation adoption curve, that sort of Sonia Seidel curve, I'd say we're about to move, if not already, into the early majority. So sort of 12% plus higher now. Uh, and as the costs increase and, and more news on uh, you know, herbicide causing cancers and, and the costs of uh, cancers and gut health, I, I think that will keep accelerating. So you see farmers, you know, converting through their own desire already? Yes, yeah, no, that's happening, uh, um, particularly in cropping and grazing and, um, and you know, associated areas, yeah. Presumably that's also largely because of you know, ultimately it's, it's more profitable. It's, it's a better financial situation for you as a farmer. Yeah, it's not just dollar driven. I, I think a, a common feedback is you start working in a really uh, innovative, exciting, alive uh, support group, which is needed. Um, emotional health, uh, mental health. That, that's a, that's some really good surveys coming out of University of Canberra on mental health in farmers, large scale surveys, the last two years shows a stark difference in the mental health of regenerative farmers against your, your industrial farmers. Uh, and that's been in the last few drought years, but so there's a lot of positives and, and links to family health and all those sorts of things. Thank you. So Steve, you've worked in, in Sydney for a long time, you know, encouraging Sydney ciders to do these sorts of things. How, how likely and how easy is it to take what we see in the movie and incorporate that to what we do at, in the, at home? Uh, once you change the way you see, it's easy. It's very likely. <laughs> so, so that's the key. But um, yeah, look, I, I, I use permaculture as a, as a framework. So I think uh, my research into regenerative ag and, and done permaculture for 20 years or so it's really helpful to have some sort of framework to work towards so you've got you've got the the path to success if you like so um, I think one of the things about the movie was for me was the um, 
guy who was kind of guiding, you know, the guru who was, who was, who was, who was guiding these guys, he, most of the, you know, it was very, broken down to very simple kind of principles and they were all permaculture principles. So, you know, value diversity, um, I can never remember them when I have to, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's, you know, there's these principles that you can, and, and you can trust the principles. So I think if people have that kind of understanding and the grounding and they see more examples like biggest little farm and, and read really good books of people who are doing this stuff. Um, it's, it's not hard. It's actually easier than the industrial method. You don't, you don't dig, you don't have to poison things. You don't have to buy stuff. You know, you're making compost. And you, you've got chooks and you've got veggies and you've got mulch and, you know, and you just it's such a joy to, to watch, to watch it happen. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's very doable and I think people are doing it. But yeah. It's really exciting. I guess the modern method is very, it's, it's, it's sort of like a worm in our head. Isn't it? It's hard, you know, cause we communicate what we all do over and over and you people sort of revert back to this way of doing things that doesn't work in, in, in tune with nature. Yeah, and it's, it seems to be inbuilt in, in the expectation of if I'm growing a vegetable garden, kill all the bugs, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the benchmark. Um, but it's not that hard to shift out of that if you see the alternative and see that, you know, ladybugs actually and, and lace wings and dragonflies and lizards will do most of the work for you. So you just plant some flowers and sit back and enjoy you know, and, and eat food. It's, I mean, it's not obviously it's not quite like that, but it's, um, you know, you can get to that point and you can get that to that point even on a balcony garden if you, if you design, use these design principles to, um, to make that system function as a system and just get out of the way and you know, stop interfering with it. And, and let it do its thing because it will look after itself. Um. Now we might sort of have a look at, you know, what it is from a point of view from a customer and how we might support um, the farmers and, and going about changing the food system. And Murat, would you like to sort of talk about your perspective having you know, run a very seasonal um, fruit and veg box distribution enterprise? Um, yeah, look, <clears throat> for me, I mean, you did say social justice and, and, and for me, sustainability um, really uh, incorporates the whole. Um, it, is, it is very important to know that we live in a, uh, in a system that is um, based on certain principles, so if we agree with it or not. And um, people do need to survive in that system and it is education of course is important and um, sharing knowledge and and making people aware of what can be done with movies like this and the knowledge we're sharing here today but um, the difficulty i think becomes in looking from at this point from a very privileged point of view and you have run food connect as well back in the day and um, it's been now about seven years that we're running Ubi. And the shift in mind is, 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 has, has changed drastically. People are more aware and people are um, more interested in these sort of things. Um, though the change comes from within people and it comes from um, an aspect of, okay, cool, this is what I can do and this is what I need to do and I know I need to do this. Um, but there's also the self that um, I, I certainly, you know, ed, ed, education is important, but I don't think education always um, creates behavioral change. There's a lot more to it. There's, there's um, um, the difficulty of, 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 of uh, people's um, livings economically and if they can afford certain things. I've mentioned before while we were talking, um, the, the labor that has gone into current farming organic regeneratively is, is, is there's an immense amount of money, uh, an immense amount of labor that needs to be uh, paid and that needs to be paid fairly. Uh, on a consumer's end, it happens that a cauliflower, a cauliflower can tend to, uh, you know, cost up to $12 a hat. And um, from a consumer's perspective, 
uh, that can be uh, unaffordable in some instances, um, especially in these current circumstances we're in. So viability is very important to me and, 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 and looking at things in a way where we um, sort of like realize that as a community, uh, like the more, the, more, the more these sort of things are supported and, and if, if, if we exist today as like Feta and Bone or Ubi or any um, other business in this field, um, in, this, in this social field, is, it is because of the community that has supported us. So while um, I do believe there's a big bubble of people already um, in this realm and, 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 and think a certain way, there's a whole lot of people who are just not there yet. And the question is of how uh, we make it possible for them to realize that it is, that how can we make it affordable for them? Uh, which is a big aspect I think we need to be thinking about and um, also showing options of viable businesses which they potentially um, in, in future can invest in um, and, and, and actually take ownership in and um, uh, you know there's the, if, if you look at the original sort of what, what CSAs used to the real definition of a CSA that you take part in a harvest um, and, and buy shares in the harvest in the beginning of the season and you, you, you share that and you share the risk with the farmer. Uh, and nowadays it is much more broad and to the point of like local markets or box schemes are considered CSAs in, in, in a certain way. We are considered CSA, CSAs. So uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really believe that we are just yet yeah, there. Yet. To an extent, yes, we are community supported, but um, it is... How, how, how willing uh, are, are we all together to realize that we actually are a lot more powerful than we think we are? Like we have created all this and, and, and um, the input of customers and the support of customers and, and making potential, uh, creating not new sort of ownership models where customers actually have an ability to buy into what we do and invest into what we do rather than relying on outside philanthropy and grants and etc it is really important for me personally to run something that is viable from in and work with p businesses and farms that can also um pay 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 their people in a in, in a fair manner and it, it is it is something that is really difficult like we need to look at the realities of things where farms really struggle to pay simple things as like workers compensation and I don't think we're looking into these sort of things where, um, oh, and we're not telling uh, enough about the difficulties people are facing uh, and why these certain things are so much more expensive. Why are farmers forced to pay people $20 an hour? Or why are they forced to work with woofers? Uh, and why is it that we can't create a viable system? Thanks, Marat. So Lauren Grant is, is another distributor within Sydney. What's your perspective on this? I'll just pick up the connectivity, really. Um, all of this relates back to connectivity, whether it's at, a, at a, a microbial level, which is what we saw in the film and how that related to insects. And, and I was interested in, in uh, Charlie's comment about the mental health of regenerative farmers. Uh, one of the real casualties of industrial farming has been the mental health of the farmers, of the practitioners who are engaged in it. And it is a, a direct expression of their disconnection. Uh, what we're all involved in is reconnecting. And whether it's, it, whether it's from the farm or from the retail side or from somebody who's establishing systems like Steve, everybody is trying to establish a different form, a, a, you know, microbial connection right through to human connection and one follows the other. And I think that's, that's the lesson that, that we saw really clearly in the mm -hmm. film. And I think it's, it's certainly the lesson of permaculture is that you set up systems of intense connection and humans benefit from that because they are embedded in those systems. It's only when you think that you're somehow separate from those systems and alienated mm -hmm. from them that you have real issues. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's true to say that many of the people who farm are highly alienated mm -hmm. from the food they produce, just as the people who consume it are. Mm -hmm. So I agree with Murat. It's, 
education is not really the thing. It is, it is about connecting people to the food systems. And, and that is our job as, as retailers is to make those stories really clear and, and to, to draw attention to farmers who are promoting connectivity and, and diversity in all its forms. And, you know, we, we think about it fairly uh, thinly in that diversity is sort of obviously important and worked on that farm. But, you know, it also works, com companies talk about the importance of diversity in their workforce. They would never think about that extending to the importance of, the of that base. as a production system yeah. and, and, and the food that comes out of those systems. So, you know, it is a, ch it is a paradigm change, but it, it is built completely on connectivity. And so our job in, in all the levels that we work at is to connect one to the other in as many possible ways as possible, both lateral and longitudinal. And so hopefully by being here, you know, this, and this is an example yeah. of this connectivity right here and the people that may or may not have been able to tune in tonight, <laughs> tonight. Uh, either through Facebook or live, uh, or who watched the film and, and, found, and found something to share. You know, that's, that's the important thing. And that's the, that's the lesson they can take away and that stays with people. Would you like to add anything, Laura? Oh, well, reinforcing what Grant said. And I think also, you know, um, I think, uh, We've talked a lot about production systems and farming, and um, that's really important. Uh, I constantly um, come up against my frustrations with the rate of change that happens in our in in the consumer economy. You know, why is it so hard for us to make different choices at the checkout? Why why are we? I mean, apart from the economic challenges, more which more referred to, you know, why is it so difficult for us to change our behaviour? Why is it that when we go and visit the farmers we work with who are, you know, regenerative farmers and whose farms often look like oases in the landscape and time and time again we visit these farms and we see that the farmers around them, you know, they don't change their behaviour. They continue sort of with a system of farming which is more about extraction than, uh, than inputs um, and yet the farmers that we work with sit in, in the middle of this and they flourish. And it seems to me obvious, if you saw that, why wouldn't you change? And the same goes for consumers, you know, in urban environments, as Steve said, it is quite simple. Once you see it in action, it's compelling and powerful and you can't, you can't unlearn what you've learned. You can't change, you know, you, you've seen a different way and it's compelling and you, you want to be that way. And we see it in our, in our, butchery you know in our shop we see we see the extraordinary privilege of being involved in helping to build and create a community of people who are experiencing that change and it's viral like it's powerful mm. once people experience the connectivity that Grant was talking about and they see there's a there's an epiphany there's a moment of awakening where they all of a sudden they step back and they go oh my god I can see everything is connected and it's like a magic moment you know and that's a wonderful thing. That's the thing we need to be constantly trying to pursue and, um, and communicate, I suppose, um, mm. as much as that. <laughs> that's what that film did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, um, there's a question in from one of the attendees and it, 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 I guess it's, it's a pretty um, big question that, that often comes up with these sorts of things. And it, it comes up with, this whole area of around sustainability, which is always, you know, so the, the question's basically around, you know, can, can regenerative agriculture actually feed a forecast of 10 billion people, you know, in a, in a way that's both healthy and affordable? You know, I think we're forecasted by about 10 billion by 2050. I guess my perspective with, you know, not being in, on the farms now is um, that, I, I see that if we if we keep heading down the path, we, we won't be able to feed anybody. But there's a there's an idea in the mainstream that we'll only be able to survive if we keep doing it the industrial way. But I might throw back to you, Charlie. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, information from from the powers that be, and and let's not forget uh, this whole industrial farming and economic system is driven by the suicidal view 
of economic rationalism, growth for the sake of growth. It's promulgated by the world's leading multinationals and most of the leading governments. So in Australia, um, government policy, departmental policy, Department of Agriculture, universities are all pushing the one thing. So that's, that's the background to it. So we're not hearing the truth. And the truth, which comes from the uh, United Nations FAO, is that around 75% of the world's food comes off peasant farms of five acres and less, and most of them are run by women. If you took that up to, um, you know, 10 acre farms, you're probably up to 80% or more of the food. So the reality is uh, we can feed ourselves. Um, and if we, um, if we get better at doing it in a healthy fashion, I, I have no doubt that uh, that scare tactic uh, is just a canard in my view. Uh, uh, we, we can do it in a sustainable way. I guess one of the things that we don't often know within Sydney is that 80% or some, you know, a very high percentage of the perishable food is grown right here in the Sydney Basin. But of course, that's under threat from all the concrete. In trouble there. So Steve, what are your thoughts about, you know, regenerative agriculture as a viable way of producing our food to all those people? Um, yeah, I think, I, I think we need to challenge the whole premise of the question. I think like Charlie was saying, it's um, you know, the idea of feeding the world is, is kind of a, um, it's an idea that certain companies like to promote as being a good idea, but I think we need to change the question to, um, you know, can the world feed themselves, like Charlie said. So it's, you know, I think I, possibly it's a deliberate, you know, it's like one of those don't think about an elephant kind of ideas. We keep promoting this idea, even as a question, you know, can we feed the world? Well, no, you know, 70% like, you know, of the world's food comes from peasant farmers. That's an awesome rebuttal to that question. I think, um, you know, I've seen in my garden and other people's gardens doing just, just gardening, um, using these principles of healthy soil diversity, and the plants go like crazy. You know, they just grow fast and get really good produce. And... Um, it's really nutritious. So I think definitely, yes, you know, regenerative agriculture is the only way that we're going to, um, that the world is going to feed itself. I think, you know, the further we go along the agriculture, uh, the industrial ag kind of pathway, the more evident it is that that is not the solution. It's just destructive, it's destroying the planet and it's not the solution. Only regenerative ag is the solution. Uh, the, the question coming back from Facebook around this is, you know, does that mean we all have to become farmers or the vast majority have to become farmers? Um. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it also about the fact that when we talk about regenerative agriculture and we talk about food, but actually regenerative agriculture, the wonderful thing which that film showed so beautifully is that regenerative agriculture isn't about food. You know, this idea of food as a thing that's isolated from energy, you know, and water and education and health, you know, what we need to understand is, is regenerative agriculture is actually about creating capacity. And that's capacity in human health, in environmental health, in species diversity, in, in carbon sequestration, you know, in, in, in capturing water. It's about, it's about ecosystem health which has a ripple effect across, you know, the entire community and all aspects of the way we live in the world. So this isn't just a food question. This is a question of how we organise and manage, you know, the world and our environment so that we can survive. This is, this is much bigger than just, I mean, food's important, of course, and we are talking about food, but, you know, it's bigger than that. But no, we don't all have to become farmers. No. But we have to be stitched in. Yeah. We have to be stitched in to the to the to the system that produces it. Yes, and, yes, yes. And right. we can do that at, at many different levels. I think we've sort of discussed that already. Uh, it, that you don't have to be a direct producer, but you have to support people who are producing. Mm. And 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 I agree. I think reframing the question is exactly right, mm. Stephen Charlie. Mm. It's mm. it's um, if 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 the solution is producing, you know, we feeding the world. On a declining fertility plane, mm. that it, that that it, it's pretty hard to argue that if you actually mm. sort of pull it apart. That 
you're, you've got declining fertility and declining capacity, as mm. Laura mentioned, and yet somehow that's going to produce the food mm. that's going to you know, feed mm. the millions. I don't buy it. I think mm. it's a con. I think that you, you either produce more capacity and that way you feed more people, mm. but you're certainly not going to do it on reduced capacity and a system that relies on reduced capacity. Mm. So, uh, you know, rephrasing the question is certainly the way to go. Thank you. Wasn't, wasn't, didn't we start off, wasn't your quote about seeing things differently, you know, and isn't that what we're actually asking people to do now? And that's, this is about seeing things differently. Let that question, let's, let's, let's see that question differently. But we're seeing things differently and like that question, that particular question, can we? I mean, as I agree with um, Charlie, we, we have 500 million smallholder farms in the world and those are mostly feeding the world. And it is um, very important that we ourselves realize that we do, because we're talking about powerful people who've got all this and, and, uh, and are running this. These people are organized. These people have technology, which they are working with. Um, just the other day I was talking to one of our farmers and it was it's like, why are you going to walk and, 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 and going to dig 400 holes for yourself if you could look into the option of getting rid of that labor and, 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 and actually creating money in order to um, create that change? Because what, 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 we, what we need to realize is, uh, and, and people watching this are probably thinking Ubi and we are you know, simply delivering food, which is really not just the instance. We are building technology behind what we're doing. And we are completely technologically independent in, in, in our supply. We don't rely on another party in, in how we run our systems. And these sort of things are very important in creating efficiency and are the only reason why we are today viable. And these sort of things I think we need to be looking at and, and, and thinking about so, and, 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 and supporting and building um, uh, further in order to actually realize these potentials we have and, and um, yeah, regenerative farming is a must. I do believe that. And I do believe that those 500 million smallholders can learn a lot from that and adapt to that. But there's a real importance in, 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 in working with technology and building our own systems to free up money so that we can make this actually viable venture overall going forward without the need of philanthropists, but just the community that is part of it. And um, hence, I'm talking about certain ways of ownership models. I mean, we have just recently seen, we have done it back in New Zealand, where we 10% of our business is actually owned uh, by the community. And we have just recently seen it where Food Connect Brisbane has just extraordinarily has raised um, money with their community in order to buy their warehouse. These are potentials we have. And these are certain aspects of realizing the power we have and that we can actually fund ourselves by believing into what we can do through what we're seeing and bringing in that money through the community and yes working collectively and building platforms and technologies in order to get that going this is really important like i i just like to so what can we do as consumers and customers supporting businesses and um, going just beyond just like, okay, this needs to be done, but how is it going to be done and how is it going to be viable? How is it going to be attractive for those who are not in this realm? Sorry, I can't, I can't. No, I don't know. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you're very rough, but we can just make you out. You do sound like that. <laughs> Quite a bit of because if you had any of the last question, which is a touch on briefly, is a question from the 10th about that lack of national 
and I guess, I guess it takes it to the, the other end of the scale. You know, no, like what, what's the end of it, what are farmers, but what, what we do, do across Australia. Australia. And then one, one of the things that we tend to make faces. Um, card card is in there. Okay. Um, so, I'm only going to try to do this. I'm having real difficulty hearing you, Julian. I'm really sorry. Say it very slowly. Like, it's, or maybe type it. Julian, do you want me to read the last question there from the Q&A? Actually, it's in a lack of national. It sounds clear. Yeah, yeah. I might just read the last question, which we'll just give Julian a chance. Um, I think he was referring to the, um, the question about the Australia's kind of the street, the scene is happening around Australia at the moment. And someone has asked, would the panel like to comment on the lack of a national food plan for Australia? Yes. What's happening kind good of question. Very good question. Hopefully that's what Julian was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's the new challenge. That is the challenge is that is, this is a policy challenge. We've talked about what it means as individuals and communities. And farmers. And farmers. Yeah. The, the, the other side to this is that it is absolutely mm. now the role of government to recognise that water, food production, ecological health and human energy. health and energy are all connected absolutely mm. and that policy decisions have to be made around our food future that are, can combine all those interests. You can't have siloed sort of inquiries yeah. into the Murray-Darling Basin without talking about general ecological health or land clearing, without talking about or carbon sequestration. You can't have these discussions in a siloed way. Government absolutely has to change its priorities and quite clearly it's going to, policy will, will drive change. It will reward growers that are producing, uh, producing food and storing carbon. That's where we've got to get to. Mm. And that's where we've got to, that's the pressure that we have to bring on our representatives mm. to make, to, to get to the point where they also realise that we don't have too many more choices and that the combination, you know, recently the three years of drought followed by fire, followed by COVID should have pointed out that we are actually in a very vulnerable position and that the idea that the illusion of abundance is just that, that we are on a very thin skin of productivity and we have to do everything we can to maintain that and develop it. And without that sort of input and coherent sort of understanding, you will never get coherent food policy in Australia. I mean, when the Australian Farmers Federation is coming out and saying that it, it, um, it's setting up um, an investigative panel into climate change um, and it's, you know, it's more progressive in some ways in the way it's approaching things than some parts of government, you know, it's ridiculous that we even have a Department of Energy or a Department, you know, or, 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 or discrete, you know, um, uh, uh, groups which look into water. I mean, these things all need to be considered and understood as holistic. You know, we need to, we need, the problems will only be solved if we understand these things as all facets of the same problem. <laughs> Charlie has something to say on this. Uh, I, could, uh, I couldn't understand Julian, it was garbled. So if someone could summarise the question, I, I might be able to respond, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then the pigeon stopped yeah. flying for a bit too. Yeah, it was about, uh, how, how does this work on a national Australia, Australian level? Like What's what, the food what, do, plan? what do we require? Where's the food plan for Australia? Well, I guess without being too cynical, um, given both the agri-political um, and the governance levels, I, I think this has got to be a bottom up. I, I sort of preach on the biological concept of underground revolution. I think at the moment, um, the vested interests lie with the big uh, food suppliers and the multinationals and, and look at our, our farming politicians, um, whatever they're saying, they're still truly backing industrial agriculture and things like glyphosate etc etc so the revolution at this stage has to be bottom up and, and and it is it's being driven by the innovators and the families and, and their supporters who are prepared to buy the healthy food so 
um, maybe later on some sort of overall policy can come or maybe it's got to come from within that group because it's no good following you know I, I watch with interest the big gathering in Melbourne every year about feeding um, feeding Australia and the planet organized by all the big corporations but um, it's all industrial and, and all, all that sort of large power yeah but unless we maintain pressure um, on our political representatives we won't get regulatory change. You know, it's, it's incumbent on all of us to work away at what we do within our communities, but also to maintain pressure because, you know, we do need regulatory change. We do need, um, you know, really sort of profound structural change. Can I, can I just, <laughs> I know I'm going in a bit heavy on this, but this is, it, is, it is just like, if we, if we just look at the world as it is right now, compared to what it, has, what it was even before COVID, and it was starting there already, um, without, without creating hopelessness, but it is, it is the truth in, 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 in that we have a very divided world. We have a very divided nation. Um, we have... Um, we, 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 do, we do want to push these things and we, we hope that, they, that, that we achieve them and that people will hear us and that people will change and that we can get these policies through. But I do, like Charlie said, I do believe in an underground revolution here as well. It is really up to the people and yeah. uh, what, we, what, we, what, we, what we do and what we create and what, how we lead and um, what options we show them that are also, again, viable. And, 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 and can actually um, uh, create that joint force in order to, uh, it's, it's, it's like changing all these people is gonna be really difficult. But if we show them a way where they can see like practically and uh, that, that, that this is actually working much better and there's a shift because of this working with people that automatically join that because this is a better version of what needs to be done and it is working and we show actually exactly how that is being done and we put out these things out then i do believe people will come but in a world that is uh, i i i feel like and, and and also like understanding the other side uh to the in, in terms of how they are thinking what are they what are they going through in their minds in order to actually have to be making the decisions they're making that are they, they, that could be detrimental for all of us. And I feel like we all stop somewhere where we, um, we, we, we stop thinking how the other side actually thinks and try and understand them and their processes in order to actually get them aboard and, 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 and along with us. Um, and, and this happens, like the issues we're facing in this world are way beyond just these little problems they are so philosophical and 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 down to the the the, the belief system and what what uh, transparency is very important and this is what transparency is probably one of the most important things in running i believe a business and creating that trust that is being lost with all these other businesses and i know feather and bone is doing an amazing job in there and this is also why you have a community like you have and i feel that too and I do believe that the community is with us and supports what we're doing because of the tr of the trust and the care we we and 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 the and the transparency we share with them. And these sort of ways of operating do get people uh, on board. And 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 we just we just live in a world where it is really difficult to trust anyone and any sort of information. So people really do feel overwhelmed with everything that shoots at them. And That's the thing, can I, just, can I just butt in there, Murat? I, I, agree, I agree with what you're saying about, um, you know, this is the thing I love about kind of forum and the people who are on, you know, Charles and Laura and Grant and Murat and Julian and all the people I get to hang out with, uh, in my day-to-day -day working life is there's a real there's a massive groundswell for this stuff people are people are becoming aware people are see food and where they buy their food and who they buy their food from as a real solution as a really positive step that they can take and it's happening you know and i think the more that happens 
you know, your neighbour does it. Like when at our house here, I put chickens in out the back 10 years ago and my neighbour sort of popped his head over the fence. <laughs> well, you got chickens? Yeah, yeah, we got chickens. And, you know, six months later, they had chickens. And then six months later, the other neighbour had chickens. So there's this whole kind of chicken frenzy going on. And it's um, and that's how it happens, you know. It's You present, like Marat was saying, you present a better way. You present this communal, healthy way that is really positive for the future and people are going to jump on board for sure Thank you. We, maybe everyone won't but you know it's, it's that's how snowballs work isn't it um, that's how thanks, snowballs Steve, work. thanks uh everybody um julian has um uh can't speak <laughs> or can only speak with it with a very deep um resonating voice um so um i i i'm conscious of the time um, but what I would like to do um, is to ask each of the panellists, um, just a, on, a, on a positive note or a sense of what, just, just to tell us one thing that, we're, that our um, the people, uh, what we could do, what we could do tomorrow um, to, to really have an effect, like maybe something small that we can really have an effect and make a big change to what's happening in the, um, the agricultural world and our food system. So maybe start with you, Steve, if you could just, no pressure. <laughs> Look, I don't know exactly what people can do tomorrow. They can tune in to our seed saving workshop, which is um, <laughs> in Zoom from the. <laughs> at, I, I, uh, you'll have to look up the time. And then after that, there's a wicking bed workshop, which shows you how you can set a garden in the backyard or the front yard or the balcony, which is really water, saves water and grows heaps of food. So um, that's where I'd recommend you start. Oh, good on you, Steve. Thank you. Um, so, Laura and Grant, what um, what should we do tomorrow to have a have? I guess something. Buy our book. Okay. Ask, <laughs> oh, buy your ask, book. Okay. Ask. Uh, ask. Practic who practical. you buy food yes, from. Yeah, this is it. How it was grown, where it came from, and and demand an answer. And if they can't answer, go to someone who can. And Fabulous. and yeah. when you do buy that food, then share it with as many people around a table as you possibly can. Oh, beautiful. Thank yeah. you, thank you. And Murat? I think really talk, talk about, it is, it is beautiful that you're doing the things you're doing. It is beautiful that you're supporting, but the talk just really needs to increase if you want to change. And that includes social media, if you like it or not. It is so powerful. It is so powerful for you to share a little photo of the people you believe in and, and um, talk about what they're actually doing because they are not just selling you boxes or cutting your meat or they doing a lot of work and they sacrifice a lot to be able to bring you or have sacrificed a lot to be able to bring you what you see. So if you talk about this, if you share this really actively, then this will grow automatically, mm. but even outside your bubble. Yeah. You know, and that yeah. is really important that you, Thank you talk. That is probably one of the most important things. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And lastly, Dr. Not, well, not lastly, but Dr. Charles Mass. Oh, sorry, Charlie. I keep on calling him Dr. Charles Mass. Because <laughs> <laughs> of the book. <laughs> as, as, Charlie, I came in, as, yes. as I came into the meeting, um, I just briefly looked at the news, you know, Siberian farm forests ablaze, uh, the mad president in Brazil wanting to destroy the Amazon, all that sort of stuff. It's very easy to get focused on our nine planetary systems that are being destabilised as we move into the Anthropocene. But this regenerative ag space is, is some of the very best solutions for water and climate and biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. So the best thing we can do is go out tomorrow, buy more chooks, plant more veggie seeds and, and support the farmers and the providors that are that are um, displaying and selling those sorts of food because we do have the exciting solutions to some of the biggest issues that our species mm -hmm. has ever faced. Wow, well, thank you very much. That's a wonderful note to finish on. And uh, on behalf of um, Julian and um, the team here, I'd like to really thank you and, for, and our audience. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, a very dynamic group of uh, people that are pushing forward for change in our community and change in agriculture and change for our world. Uh, so we'll sign off now. I want to thank um, Laura and Grant and Murat and 
Charlie and Steve, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for our team behind the scene. Um, we had a glitch in the beginning, we had a glitch at the end, so we bookended that. We did provide some wonderful weather so people would stay at home tonight to watch you. Um, all the best, everybody, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank for you. joining us. Thank you very us. much. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Bye. I enjoyed it.